Well, hello everyone and welcome to our live session today. I will be going before we begin over a quick start presentation to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and various opportunities if you have, of course, not previously attended any of our shadowing sessions. We do want to highlight that Pre-Health Shadowing is, is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter the demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Jesus Alvarez. I am the Chief of Program Planning here at Pre-Health Shadowing, and I want to thank you all for attending today. Now, let's get started. Here, okay. Just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and if you need assistance enabling the transcript, please direct message one of our team members. We are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everyone. So again, please, if you have any recommendations for how we can improve you, for how we can improve, I'm sorry, you can email us at info at prehealthshattering.com. So, since this is an international program, we want to know where are you guys Zooming from today? You can drop it in the chat to let us know. Okay, I see you guys are okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, you guys. I, myself, am calling in from the wonderful island of Puerto Rico from the Caribbean. If you want to stay in the loop, you can follow us on social media. We are active on both Instagram and TikTok, or you can also sign up for our email list on our website to never miss a session. We want to announce that we have partnered with Kaplan to get our, our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products, as well as for the resources, such as study guides to help you prepare for standardized tests like the MCAT, the NCLEX or the PCAT. If you fill out our short survey in the chat, we will get in signed up for these deals for free. We also would like to draw your attention to another amazing program that is Neolith. Neolith is an online mental health platform for students. For pre-health professionals especially, we know that the path isn't easy. And that is why we have partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to their services if you, if you use the link in the chat or enter the code PREHEALTH when signing up. Additionally, we are excited to announce that we have partnered up with Krispy Kreme for you to purchase one delicious dozen donuts to enjoy with your loved ones. With a donation of $10 or more, you'll be able to receive your treat while also helping us at PHS. For more information and instructions, um, you can find them by clicking the link sent in the chat. We also just got our PHS merch. This is another way to help our organization and acquire a really nice piece of clothing, that being t-shirts, long sleeves, or hoodies, to represent PHS and our mission. Mask for Mask is an amazing women-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic, those in the homeless community, healthcare workers without their proper equipment, and others who are struggling to stay safe. With our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off your order. If you buy through this method, pre health shuttering will also get a 10% off the proceeds, which is amazing because as I mentioned earlier, we are a nonprofit that runs solely off of the support of our community. If by any chance you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be a part of our administrative team and lead students in various projects and initiatives with professional outreach, grant writing, and much more. We, of course, understand that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time, so we also offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously with tasks that can be done on your own time. We would love to have you be part of this program and contribute your own unique perspective. Also, 
great news. If you're a high school student and want to get involved, we have started a program called HTP or High School Training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-help programs, get involved in fundraising for PHS, and organize resources for other high school students that are interested in medicine through pre-health shadowing. We want to recognize the hard work of all of our students here at PHS. Um, so if you're interested in getting published, you can submit essays, reflections, research papers, and reviews to our editor-in-chief through the link dropped in the chat to have your work on our website. This will definitely look great on CVs, applications, resumes, etc. So do take advantage of this if you will. <laughs> Part of our mission here at PHS is to promote diversity. And in order to do this, we have launched an initiative to have monthly panels to celebrate different demographics in the field of medicine. Some of these upcoming events include a series on patient experiences, a COVID-19 roundtable, and International Student Forum. If you have a mentor, professor, or professional that has inspired you and you think they could contribute to these conversations, nominate them today using the link that was dropped in the chat. If you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. As you know, Pre-Health Shattering is completely student run and we are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, Zoom and our website are not free, so any contribution you can give would be greatly appreciated. If you're not financially able, we request you send this link to someone you think can, so we can contribute to support, uh, so we can continue to support those who cannot afford similar opportunities. Throughout this session today, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker in the chat, and our team members will be making note of these to be asked in the latter half of the session, that is the Q&A session. We advise you to take good notes as a professional is going over their presentation, as there will be the chance to take post a post-shattering assessment to verify your ritual shattering hours. More information will be available on this at the end of this session, so stay tuned. <laughs> Lastly, if you can, we request you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation as we are respectful of different circumstances, but it does help us feel closer together in a time when socially distancing is mandatory. We also request that you make sure to meet yourself as this will ensure the professional has the complete and full attention from the audience. Once again, I appreciate you all for listening. And now I would like to welcome a professional, Dr. Kim Bo. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you are ready. Sure. All right. Um, right now it does say that I can't share my screen. Uh, could you try again? Okay, now it works. Great. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so let me see, here it goes. All right, let me know if that is all good on there. Yeah, we could see it. Yep, we can see it. All, all right. good. All right, great. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'd say this is an like an amazing opportunity. Thank you for having me here. Um, but basically, let's talk about pharmacy. I don't know how many of you guys have thought about pharmacy, but we'll dive right into it. So. My name is uh, Dr. Kim Bo. I am a pharmacist and I'm also working at a pharmacy school and I also do some clinical practice at St. Jude's Providence in the pharmacotherapy clinic. So um, let's get right into it. So I'm just gonna first go over my disclosures and disclaimers, which is I have nothing to disclose, um, but anything I talk to you guys about today, I don't guarantee admission, but I will talk about some highlights and some tips that I have. Um, I won't provide any medical or health recommendations, but I will talk about some cases and interesting things that I've uh, saw along the way as a pharmacist. And then all materials is for uh, your educational needs. So here are my learning objectives. 
Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to understand the landscape of pharmacy as it's evolving, identify areas for pharmacy employment, and then explain the role of the pharmacist within this new healthcare team model, and then identify the prerequisite requirements amongst a lot of other information I'm uh, able to share. So um, this is just going to be an introduction about myself so that you guys can have a, a bit of a background of what information I can provide and what sort of experiences I can provide. So here I'm going to just show you like a map of all the places I've done for pharmacy school. So uh, here I was born and raised in California, actually, and I went to school for my undergrad at UC Irvine for two years and two years at UCSD. So anyone who's in the area, go <laughs> Tritons and Anteaters. But uh, this is where my career in pharmacy really began, is where I went to school, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I decided just to you know, volunteer at a couple of pharmacies. I shadowed my cousin, everything, like just looking at how things are. And kind of interestingly, <laughs> things to note is that at this point in my life, I almost decided not to become a pharmacist because I didn't have a great interaction with patients. I was very shy. And so I thought about marine biology instead, but um, my parents did tell me to continue on, um, you know, going through my experiences and see how that goes. And as more and more time progressed, as I volunteered at an independent pharmacy, I saw how much of a great need that pharmacists were able to provide for their patients. So that's why I pursued pharmacy. I joined the a pre-pharmacy society at UCSD. I don't know if any of you guys have that at your uh, respective schools as being pre-med or even just thinking about uh, you know, different opportunities while you're in college. But once I joined that organization, I was able to you know, make so many different friends. And so you know, no surprise that a lot of us are pharmacists now, but it was such a great network. And I learned so much about pharmacy that I decided to pursue and apply for school. So that led me to fly way across the country uh, to a place in Ashburn, Virginia, where I attended Shenandoah University, uh, Virginia School of Pharmacy. Um, they had two locations, one in Winchester and one in Ashburn. I went to the Ashburn School and actually was in that little small cohort in a um, offsite campus of only 14 students. So there were only 14 of us. So you can imagine like I had so much one-on-one -on -one with all my professors. I occasionally traveled back to the main school in Winchester where the rest of my 70 or so cohort of students and colleagues were um, where we you know, developed the next four years of our lives. And then after that, I got my first year residency um, at the, so I moved to Texas, drove all the way to Texas because I got my first year residency and I'll talk to you guys more that pharmacists uh, or pharmacy students, you know, after they finish, what do they do after that? And sometimes they pursue post-grad careers and in going into residencies and fellowships, just similar to medical and some of the other professions. So I enjoyed like a year in Texas. It was pretty cool. You know, I got to be in a, a kind of in the middle of nowhere in Temple, Texas, but I was close by to Waco and also Austin as well. So for the year, you know, everything was so cheap out there. Like I should have bought housing, but gas and you know, you can just eat endless steaks or whatever you want to do. It's so cheap out there. And then after that, I was deciding, okay, now I want to get a job. But um, at some point through my residency training, I still had the passion to actually pursue uh, my ambulatory care career, but also I was very interested in teaching. And so I asked my my mentor while I was in Texas, you know, what can I do? Can I find a job in teaching? And she had mentioned, actually in the state of Texas, it's very hard to get a job, especially as an academic without a second year residency. So that kind of led me to apply to a second year residency. And here's me kind of like traveling back up north to Oregon where I did my second year residency and actually fellowship. So two and a half years in Oregon, uh, in Portland where I did my uh, ambulatory care, uh, you know, specialty rotation and residency at the Oregon State University, and then also my fellowship at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Um, and then I kind of here, I also put Central City Concern. That was the federally qualified healthcare clinic that I did my practice in ambulatory care training at. And then after two and a half years there, I now moved back to where I am now, which is 
uh, being a faculty member or an assistant professor at Marshall B. Ketchum University, where I just saw the second a year of graduates just literally just graduating. Actually, they're still graduating. Um, and we just did the ceremony. So that's our second year uh, cohort that just graduated. So I know that was a lot for an introduction, but I'm ready to start talking about pharmacy. So I guess I have a first poll that's coming up. So the first question really is, who's already thinking about pharmacy? So if they're yes, no, maybe. And then if you wanna say why, you can also check in the chat bar as well. All right. Okay, so the results are in. All right, so it looks like 14% says yes, 32% says no, and then 55% said maybe. All right, so we'll see uh, what you guys decide after today. But um, then my next question really is, what is the big, biggest reason if you were thinking about pharmacy, why you, you would choose so? I had some answer choices here, but if you wrote in the chat bar, that's fine as well. I don't know if I can actually, yeah, I can see the chat. So I, I'm not sure if anyone's uh, typing it in or if there was a second poll that came up. Well, there's not a second poll, but um, I at least want to uh, pursue a PharmD degree. And one of my biggest reasons, um, it's because I actually really love biochemistry. And um, I recently took a course in synthetic drugs basically and how they work in the body and I just thought it was completely amazing how you know you can apply that to many things really in healthcare and that's why I decided to become a you know to pursue a PharmD degree. After that, is awesome. that is awesome and I would have to say um, after doing a lot of interviews now for this school and some other schools um, I would say generally, even my answer was the biochemistry class got to me. <laughs> um, in addition to that, though, now there's just so much more reasons. And I'm hoping to, you know, talk to you guys about those reasons, because, you know, once you go into pharmacy, it's it's really changed. Um, it's changed since I've gone into like went to school and then now it's changed again, where because of the pandemic, it really highlighted the um, the services of pharmacists, pharmacy students, and you guys will actually get to use a lot of chemistry. Like some schools, especially our school, we have a medicinal chemistry class um, with a medicinal chemist. Um, and then other pharmacology courses, those are like my favorite because it's kind of interesting to learn that how this drug actually looks like this and actually, you know, hits this receptor, so on and so forth. It's so interesting. And a lot of people think that by the time you become a pharmacist and all you really just tell patients is how to take it and everything like that, you always have to go back to your basic sciences and figure out, does that make sense to you? And who knows, you guys might be the next ones that actually go into research into pharmacy and create these new medications. All right, great, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I definitely have a lot of chemistry. <laughs> All right, next. All right, so I don't know if this poll three comes up. It's more of an open. Um, I, I want you guys to be very uh, chatty in the chat bar, but how would you describe a pharmacist? Because it's very interesting actually having gone through pharmacy school that it's not what I thought it would be. <laughs> so it looks like some answer choices here. How would you describe a pharmacist? Oh intelligent, scientific, passionate, or all of the above. And of course, if you have any other descriptors, feel free to write in the chat bar. Of course, I'll be closing the poll in a little bit. And now, sharing the results. All right, good. <laughs> I like to see that it is all the above. And actually, nowadays, um, a lot of pharmacists, and I wouldn't say like, it's not just the pharmacists, but the whole team, anything in pharmacy, pharmacy tech, pharmacy student, pharmacy intern, whoever in pharmacy. Um, you just have to have so many different qualities now and, and be very well-rounded. Um, not just like, you know, one quality, although your team members might think of you for one thing versus the other. 
All right. Okay, so then here's kind of like my true definition of a pharmacist is just someone who manages some aspect of a patient's care and has skills in medication management utilizing evidence-based approaches. So I think I had a question on here that said, what made you choose pharmacy rather than a medical degree? In honesty, it wasn't even on the forefront of my mind to go for a med medical degree. Um, actually, but through my pharmacy degree, I kind of almost thought at the very beginning that hmm, maybe I'd like to go with medical because I'm actually really skillful in diagnosing patients. Um, but at some point, I fell so more in love of talking to patients with as much time as possible, talking about their medications, how to take them and all those things. So that, that was just like the main difference. So I will tell you now that what I do as a pharmacist is very much similar to a primary care physician or, you know, like a physician assistant, nurse, nursing practitioner, whoever. Um, as long as I get like at least 30 minutes to an hour with a patient, that is something that I do as an ambulatory care pharmacist. We do focus a lot more on the medications than anything else. So patients usually get referred to us after they've been diagnosed with something. And maybe even the doctor decides they want to start on a specific medication. It then becomes my, then it hands to me where I'm just looking at the patient as a whole again, and just to seeing if there's anything else that would prevent this patient from being on this medication, either, you know, there's some alternatives, some non-pharmacology alternatives, the patient says something extra to me at another visit, and I'm just like, oh, wait a minute, there might be something that we have to take care of before you can be on this medication. So very similar, a lot of people who do go through pharmacy school do at some point decide that they want to just then pursue medical. So it's just all about what you think you know, like, where do you think that you want to see yourself? Either more at the front end of just like diagnosing, um, knowing like maybe a good surface amount of medications to start on. But I would have to say it, it becomes like a blur of line as pharmacy education starts increasing. So we provide a lot of services. We even learn right now, like if you go and apply through any of the schools, one of the requirements for accreditation of a pharmacy school is that they have to work with physicians. So schools like UCSD, our school, we do a lot of, uh, we actually have a lot of classes of students taking uh, the, some of their classes with the medical students, with the PA students, with the optometry students. So yes, like they also learn how to do eye exams, and we keep trying to, like, apparently we keep amazing all the other schools that, yes, we can do some of these things as well. So that's just um, it's kind of a hard thing to say, but I actually never thought about medical. It was always between microbiology and pharmacy. <laughs> all right. So what are the important qualities? So this is something I just took off of a healthcare website, but it's basically true that we should have good analytical skills. So now it's become more important that as part of the hub of the team, we have to make sure because we have such high touch with the patients that we have to make sure that we still have good analytical skills, making sure we choose medications based on so many different factors. Like you think about, you know, uh, can the patient afford it? Is it the best compared to all the other ones according to data? Um, so many things. Um, the second thing that I really, I'm gonna consistently like highlight this throughout my presentation is the communication skills. This is something where I almost gave up pharmacy because I was so shy that I did not want to talk to any patients. <laughs> I just want to stay behind the counter and just like do my work. Um, but at some point I learned through pharmacy school and I really developed through pharmacy, pharmacy school actually is my communication skills because nowadays because the patients are looking towards pharmacists as you know, like the easiest person to get to because they're just like right there. Um, whatever they talk to you about, it's very important that you receive that information very well and then communicate that to like either a doctor, nurse or whoever that you're supposed to talk to uh, in conjunction with in your team or even over the phone. Like communication skills are so important to develop because in school now you're required to write so many different SOAP notes which are like documentation notes and then do so many oral exams because they want you to really develop through your communication in both written and oral. And then the third thing that I thought about was important qualities is computer skills. And that's just to be more general, to say that 
nowadays, because of the sheer amount of patients that are in the world, um, like right now, doctors are having such a hard time, you know, having an appointment because their appointments are booked out like three months in advance, whereas a patient can come see me in like the next two weeks at least. But you really need to utilize technology to help you really fast forward through everything. So nowadays, uh, you know, when I started pharmacy school and I went through a rotation at a hospital, there was a hospital that literally still had paper prescription or sorry, paper documentation. So I would have to go up to like the third floor and me and my preceptor would be like, oh, shoot, where's that? Where's that folder with the paper? We got to go find it. Whereas now everything is like on an electronic health system because it's now required and, you know, the government really passed for it and it's really important. But having the ability to adapt to different technologies would definitely help you as a pharmacist. And then the next one is being detail oriented. I would have to say personally, I'm not the most detail oriented, but I could be detail oriented when it comes to patient care. Um, so on my own, like I just forget things all the time, but when I see a patient, I'm like extra attentive. And, and if I see that there are times where I can't remember certain things, so I take strategies, including writing things down, putting everything in a notebook, putting everything online, whatever it, it takes for you to become very engaged with your patient care. You got to be very detail oriented or become one. And then the last one that no one really thinks about is managerial skills. So even as a startup pharmacist, you know, let's start up as in once you finish pharmacy school, everybody is supposed to have enough skill to go work in the retail or community pharmacy. And when you're doing so, and not a lot of people think about this, is that you become like the only pharmacist, or maybe there's a couple of pharmacists there with you in that pharmacy, and you have to be able to manage your team very well. So you're going to have technicians, like one or many, you're going to have a student there, one or many, you're going to have patients there, you're going to have, you know, you have to deal with the phones and everything like that. And you just have to make sure that you know how to delegate. And you'll learn that, you know, through school, hopefully, um, or that on your own too, that you want to take up these managerial skills that you know, when you're in your team, you're able to delegate. Um, this expands further too into this new team-based model. So now a pharmacist is integrated in a team. So we no longer just work in the basement, but now we're just like very uh, decentralized into different floors. And so you're able to, you have to be able to manage yourself within the team, you know, with the physicians, with the nurses, with everybody. Like you're going to have to be there to lead when possible or be able to follow directions. All right, so if you wanna know what we do, you can always just uh, you know go online, go to indeed.com, simply hired at usajobs.org, any search, you know, search engine that you go in to find a job and just put in pharmacist and then put a location that you wanna do, I just put in California. So what exactly do we do? So here are the essential responsibilities that you'll find in most uh, job searches, which is complete working knowledge of and skill to apply practices, principles, and techniques related to medication safety. And then the second thing is provides appropriate drug information for all clinical programs. So that one seems to be uh, you know, uh, something that's obvious for us. But what people don't know now is that a lot of things are happening right now, right now in pharmacy. It's been happening for a while, but right now, because of COVID, everything's being pushed through for pharmacy. So here are the impacts of pharmacy that have extended our responsibility. So you guys might hear some, I don't know, it, I don't know if you guys will hear this, but we have different legislations where we talk to our senators, we talk to Congress, whatever it does, the, you know, whatever it takes, we have like actually extended the responsibilities of pharmacists. So I'm gonna give an example, which is legislation D SB 493, provider status um, started in 2013, but moving forward now, pharmacists are able to prescribe hormonal contraceptives, nicotine replacement therapy, naloxone, which is, you know, if someone overdosed on an opioid, they should be, or, um, or alcohol abuse or anything like that, will have things that are available to them so they don't have to take those extra time to try to book an appointment. Travel medications. Uh, we definitely lead in immunizations. And I actually have to say too, if anyone's interested in optometry, uh, we just trained some of our optometry school 
for those students and those professors to also give vaccines because we really need to ramp up our vaccinations. Um, we're going through like another legislation right now, which I think passed Senate and we're gonna see how far it goes, but it allows pharmacists to order and interpret tests as well. And that's something I actually do already, but I do it based on a, a specific protocol, which allows me to do that because I have a protocol that's established with other providers. But now this is allowing all pharmacists to order interpret tests. And then also administering some uh, drugs and biologics. So I'm gonna kind of show you an example, but in my clinic, because I specialize in providing like the first pharmacy touch for patients who have autoimmune conditions for um, gastroenterology, like anyone with infection, uh, inflammatory bowel disease or patients with rheumatological disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and osteoporosis, I provide them like uh, first injection training. So once I help them get the medication, um, and give them the education that they need. And if it gets approved, they'll come back to me to get their first injection training. So anywhere, like I have so many different demos and things like that, that I go over with them. And then finally, there's also the advanced practice pharmacist, which is a certification. So if you um, take an extra test after you finish, you get enough hours, all the requirements uh, for them, like uh, for, even retail or community pharmacists, even if they haven't gone through additional training, they can get this license or the certification advanced practice pharmacist and do even more than what I've talked about today. So let's see, it looks like I have a question here. What's the process of prescribing new medication? For example, what do you do if a new drug just received FDA approval? How do you choose between past alternative and the new drug? Okay, so yeah, I mean, constantly right now, I would have to say, and kind of a little biased to autoimmune conditions because I think that's like the new wave of medications or the biologics and biosimilars, but there's a lot of new medications that are getting approved right now and also approved for like old drugs getting approved for new indications. So how do I choose between them? So honestly, I basically work with the physician and in my practice, the physician actually they're, they're specialists, so they're rheumatologists or gastroenterologists. So they see the patient first, they actually make a choice, and then they refer the patient to me. For me, I look at the choices just to think, is that gonna be something appropriate because I have to go through insurance and I have to make a, you know, making a justification that this is both a safe, effective drug and it's gonna help with costs for the patient. So. What we learn about in school, you guys heard probably hear this in pre-med and stuff like that too, is guidelines. So uh, first we'll look to the guidelines, which is you know committees of different organizations, different body systems, diseases, everything, and see what do they generally recommend and is it a high recommendation, is it a low recommendation, whatever it is, and then we evaluate to see, okay, I mean, is that a high recommendation that the patient should be on, and do we agree to it, and then. If a new medication comes out, generally I do see physicians start going towards the newer medications, but only if they really um, they really see that it's justified to do so. Uh, but a lot of the newer medications, be, you know, it really depends on the patient's insurance too. Like I have to do a lot of appeals because sometimes the insurance says, no, we're moving to the new drug or we got to go with the old drug. And in honesty, like I just look at everything about the patient and if I me and the physician and the patient all think that these are reasonable options. Sometimes we just choose one if you know we're given three options and there's no difference between the three. If there is a substantial difference, like for instance, the newer medication does have better um, efficacy or it's um, you know it has less side effects than the other one, but still quite as effective, we'll probably think about that one. So those are the decisions that we make all the time. And um, I would have to say like even per patient, like every time, like we always make at least one intervention and think about is that the right decision for the patient? Because, um, and I keep saying patients because every time we make a decision, if we don't include the patient, sometimes they will not take the drug because you know we go, oh, that's an infusion, that's not an oral medication, that's like $10,000, you know, all those things we have to take into account too. So sometimes we make an adjustment and go for the drug that's just as good or close to being as good if that's what the patient can take. 
Yeah, so um, kind of interesting about FDA approval. Um, I did get to do a rotation as a student at the FDA. It's pretty cool, like getting to see, you know, one, one day where they invited all the media and all the patients and all like the drug reps and everything to talk about that one drug. And what they do there is that they talk about, okay, like this is the data that we have. And then the FDA, you know, then they come back and forth and, and keep on talking about the drug. And then finally they bring the patient up and then they really decide from there if they're gonna FDA approve it or not. And of course they're gonna have to have specific tests for those manufacturing companies to make sure that they meet those requirements. But once it gets approved, it will be in the news. We'll see it on the FDA. Um, our pharmacy board will send us information. We'll read up on it. We actually do a lot of journal clubs. So like a lot of us pharmacists gets together and even like nationally, we get together and we talk about it. We talk about the drug and saying like, is that something we want to introduce into our hospital system or into our clinic? So there's a lot of decisions. Um, a lot of the times um, we do get involved in what's called the um, Pharmacy and Therapeutics uh, Committee, which is the P&T Committee. And they, some, they, as a group, all providers who are representing pharmacists, uh, nutritionists, nurse practitioners, we all get together and someone presents the data and then we make a decision from there as well if we wanna keep it on our formulary. All right. Okay, so I have like a weird poll question, but which fruit do you guys think is best? <laughs> so I don't know if there is a poll question that pops up for it or if anyone just wanna chat. <laughs> I think I got like a good, Good round of all three fruits. Oh, banana. I think banana is winning now. Oh, <laughs> I like that. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> so the reason why I asked this question is I was trying to think, okay, before you get into pharmacy school or even to any medical school and you don't have that medical background, how do you make the decisions that you make? <laughs> right? So if you were to say which fruit is best, okay, you have three choices, but what are the other things that you think about? So those are things that I think about too, right? Not every one of my decisions, but I like to think that as an analogy where, okay, I come up with the patient and the doctor goes, this person needs a fruit to meet their daily requirements to stay healthy. Okay. So the person goes up and then you're like, okay, which fruit would you like? And they're like, I don't know, which one do you, would you recommend? And so you got to start thinking about each fruit on its benefits and its, and its cons. So if you think about the banana, the apple, the orange, you're probably thinking, okay, uh, like a pill, I want them to easily take, eat that or swallow it. Maybe the banana is the softer let, if it's an elderly patient and they can't really chew a, an apple or can barely open a, a, an orange. The other thing I think about is allergies. So same with medications. I think about what is the person allergic to? Are they allergic to any ingredients of the medication? So are they allergic to bananas? And then I have only two other options. And again, I'm thinking this is an elderly person that can't really chew anything. Do I make it something easier for them, like an orange where I can easily split it open and then maybe juice it? So these are all the different things that Weirdly enough, I thought about fruits, but these are the things we think about medications is that they're so unique. Like the you got injectables, orals, infusions, some things that you just put underneath the tongue and it dissolves, something that you just put a patch on, so many different things. So like even with a patch, the things that we think about is, are they hairy? Like, would you wanna put a patch on that hairy arm and pull it off? That doesn't seem very pleasant. <laughs> or is the patient willing to also make adjustments where they're okay with shaving that little area and putting a patch on? So, um, oh, and then someone's comment, I, but I want to be the doctor. <laughs> so yes, um, I would say like, be, you know, be the doctor, but also be the person that actually empowers that patient to also help make these decisions as well. All right, let me see. Okay. All right, so actually, what do we do? Um, so someone, uh, someone, there's a body of uh, the Joint Commission, like they actually came up with 
a process that all pharmacists should technically follow. We've been doing this for a very long time, but we just never put anything in anything into a visual or words. So this is called the pharmacist patient care process and every student comes in learning about this. And I can already see their eyes rolling every time I bring up this wheel because it's in every single class, every single syllabus, every single class I tell them, what's your favorite wheel? <laughs> yes, it's the PPCP, the pharmacist patient care process. So this is something that we constantly tell our students to learn because if they, start engaging in with other providers or even with patients and they and they're often asked what do you guys do um, this is something that we train our students now this is since 2015 to tell everybody this is the things that we do so we do starting from the yellow we start with collect so we collect as much information this is like putting our detective hat on we collect information when we talk about subjective which is anything the patient tells us or objective where we have labs and things that are like out, like it can be reproducible and then understanding the relevant history of the patient. After we gather all that information, um, we start to assess like everybody else, like a provider will start assessing the information and really putting everything into key pieces. So this is where we're thinking about the apple, banana and orange. Like how do we determine what is the actual appropriate treatment, drug, or what should the patient do? And then finally, the plan is when we actually execute everything. Like we say, here's a bullet list of, here's like a list of for the patient to do anything that we told them to do. And then as we implement that, we also follow up and then monitor and evaluate just as their physician and everything else. So in my practice, um, I'm like, you know, I have this protocol where I have in, an agreement with the physician that once they're seeing the patient for the first time, they can just refer to me and then I would just do all this, collect, assess, plan, implement, and then I would constantly follow them. And since I follow patients who have chronic diseases, so diseases that or conditions that they'll have for the rest of their life mostly, um, I'll be following them for, well, forever, I guess, in a sense, or whenever they decide to leave. <laughs> um, but at the center of this, we always want to make sure that we keep the patient at the center of our care. So a lot of care needs to be provider centered. So like a lot of us, we still kind of have that, um, that tendency to like think about, okay, this is what I need to tell the patient. And it's all about what I think, but really like we should always put the patient at the center of everything. I tell them, I know this is a lot of responsibility, but now we need you to sit in the driver's seat. You tell the rest of the team what to do because we can guide you. We like give you the options and everything like that. But at the end of the day, um, you'll have to make these decisions because now that healthcare has gotten so complicated, like all these disease states are coming out, the technology has gone so really good to so everybody's getting diagnosed with everything, but because they now have a team of physicians, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, optometrists, everybody as part of their team, they need to really help us stay cohesive. And we try our best to like, you know, when they feel like they're sick and everything like that, we'll say, don't worry, we'll take over from here, but we'll need you to to manage that right after that. And then the things, how we keep, you know, everything cohesive is that we need to collaborate with other healthcare professions. So one thing, one tip that I wanna make sure is that if you guys become any healthcare professionals, never professionally shame anyone. They're all part of your team. Just think of them as part of your family. And then communication, again, like I said, I bring this up multiple times is that you have to really learn your craft as a communicator. So you'll have to eventually, like if you don't feel like that's your strong suit and that, that was not my strong suit at all, I would just keep working on it. You know, like I had to take the courage, raise my hand, talk to my, my uh, professor and it's kind of hard. Like I said before, I was in a class of 14, so there's no way they can like overlook me in uh, raising my hand and asking questions. So they really just like make sure everybody talked. And then finally documenting. So um, I won't go in a whole lot here because like documenting is so variable, but it's also, again, like it will showcase your, your, writing, your writing abilities. Okay, right, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna give you like some statistics because I'm gonna tell you this right now, when I talk about the courses that you'll need to take in pharmacy school and even before pharmacy school includes statistics and it's not my favorite subject but it is like 
a very important topic because when we're looking at the different evidence and we're reading all these journals and, and things that are being published about different medications, we actually had to rely a lot on our statistical skills, like biostatistics, to really think about, did this paper really do a good job? Did this research do a good job? And then do we really trust the results that we're seeing? So here's, uh, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number of jobs since 2019 for pharmacy is 321,700, which to them is a 3% a decline. Um, but through COVID-19, I would have to say that seems more like because everything is shifted. So no longer we're just focusing on the traditional pharmacists in the community aspect, but more so that, you know, we're doing other things as well, taking other roles, really, you know, taking impact in vaccinations for certain, and then some other things too, mail delivery, all these things. We're, we're changing our services a lot. But the median pay, I'm sure you guys are very interested. In 2020, the median pay for pharmacists, $128,710 per year. That's equivalent to $61.88 per hour. And it really ranges. Um, I would say like before uh, I went to pharmacy school, a lot of pharmacists were getting jobs where they were paying bonuses, they were giving away cars, all these things, but no longer, unfortunately, and pensions, but that's no longer the case. Now it's just more like, um, you know, just a salary. And sometimes it, you know, some people like, depending on how much more work or how much of a niche that you guys have in different areas of pharmacy that I'll talk about, it can go way much higher or it could be a little bit lower as well. So I'm in academic pharmacy. So I'm not quite as where the average is, but I still have the other flexibility in my job where it makes up for that. Okay. All right, so as we're talking about finances, finances, I do wanna say that you guys really need to think about to make sure before you jump right into pharmacy school or any medical profession. And this is something that, you know, not a lot of us thought about when we applied and, you know, we're just like, we just want a job. We just want something like in the field of science, healthcare, we want to help people. And then we just dive right in without really having a plan to think about what happens when we graduate because pharmacy schools are getting more expensive. On average, it's about 40 to $50,000 per year. And a lot of schools are from anywhere from one to three, mostly four-year pharmacy schools. And it could be as high as $78,000 per year. This is actually something that my brother had to pay for. So he right now is an oncology pharmacist who's working as a medical science liaison for an oncology. And he went through school at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, and that was $78,000 per year, which is insane. I mean, it was still, it, he only had to do three years, but it was still a lot. And he actually ended up just really like being very aggressive on his loans. And he did end up paying off within five years, which is it, it, insane, but he did that. But something to think about because right now, um, you know, I'm going through my loan process. I'm working for the school, which is a nonprofit organization. And in doing so, we can go through different loan forgiveness. And so those are the things you want to think about before you're applying to pharmacy school is which pharmacy school, how much it costs, where do you think you're going to project yourself into working, like is it in the public sector, so on and so forth. I know it's not the sole thing to think about because it's so common amongst all the health professional schools anyways. But something to think about is that um, because myself and another uh, co-worker at school, we do have these financial classes for students because we really want to talk to them to say, the moment you enter your first year, talk to that financial counselor that exists at that school, no matter which school you go Hello. to. Because My name you is know. Kevin Alexander, president of Marshall B. Ketchum University. Oh, sorry about that. Welcome to the College of Pharmacy commencement <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> You're hearing my All right, sorry about that, but you guys just got a taste of <laughs> the graduation rerun. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like I said before, um, pay attention to um, the financial aspects of wherever you're applying. It is 
it is an investment on your career. Um, so just make sure, you know, like everybody is coming from a different background. I've heard, you know, some students, they're able to get a loan from their parents or whatever it may be, just pay attention before you uh, apply or as you're applying, talk to that financial counselor. Uh, so I got a question is what's the work life balance like? Um, I would have to say uh, as a student, and I would say in any healthcare profession or post -grad or graduate school, is that it's pretty intense in terms of after being becoming a pharmacist, depending on which area that you go into. So I did work um, as a retail pharmacist for uh, like a year as a, uh, well, both as an intern in school and as a pharmacist at Target before it became CBS, but it was a you know, not that bad. It was, you know, uh, the average hours for the retail pharmacist is about 12 to 14 hours. I know it's a lot, but that's generally what it's like unless you become a part-time pharmacist. Um, in academia, um, there's un an unwritten rule that you're working 24 seven because, you know, you're constantly grading, <laughs> you're constantly grading and doing administrative work. Or if you decide that you wanted to do a project, you'll have to spend like maybe another day grading all those at night. <laughs> Um, however you want to do, but there is a flexibility in academia, which I'll talk about later. Um, as a clinical pharmacist or even inpatient, um, outpatient pharmacist, um, I think some pharmacists will work the eight to five, so it's not too bad. Um, a lot of us still, you know, we make, we try to make the time. I know a lot of us are kind of in that burnout mode and, and we're all, all addressing it right now, but a lot of uh, pharmacists, they're still doing other things that they want to do. Like for me, I still set aside time, like two days of the week to do, you know, to do a workout training for an hour. Um, I even like got my, uh, phys what was it? Yeah. Physical training, a certification just for fun. Um, you know, uh, because of COVID obviously not a lot of us went out and, and actually increased our workload because we started to work more from our desk. Um, but after a while now, I think as things are starting to get a little bit better, we're making a lot of time. And I'm actually the chair of my wellness committee for all the faculty. So it's like up to me and my, my committee to kind of decide of what we can do for a wellness event. So every, every quarter we come up with something. So next Friday, um, we're going to come, we're going to, um, or at least me, I'm hosting a virtual murder mystery. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> But yeah, so we're, I would have to say with work-life balance, it's kind of what you make it because some people, like especially after I got out of school, I think I was just still in that resident mode and I just kept working so often. And then now as I see everybody else, I'm kind of reminding myself to back off and do what I can. And as long as I get the things done, especially with academia, it's kind of easy because you put all the work up front and eventually every year after that, you should be able to um, do less and less. For the pharmacies that you work with, like um, for instance, if you go into a high demanding retail pharmacy, pharmacy um, they do anywhere from like 500 to 800 scripts a day. So you can only imagine, especially in those pharmacies, they probably have other pharmac pharmacists with you, probably a, an amazing team of technicians, maybe a couple of students in there, whatever it may be. Um, you should be able to just do all the work while you're there. And then for those pharmacists, they can just leave at the end of the day, you know, when they finish their 12 to 14 hours and then really just do whatever they want with their time. So. Those are the things you wanna think about is academic pharmacy. You're probably thinking about pharmacy 24 seven. For retail pharmacists, you do the work there, then you leave. Some community, some uh, ambulatory care pharmacists like myself too, like um, I still do some work at home because I have the ability to. Some pharmacists, they only have, you know, they're hourly, they can only see what they see. And then at the end of the day, they just leave and do whatever they'd like to do. Um, other things to think about in terms of scheduling is that some pharmacists do the traditional Monday through Friday. Some, some pharmacists, they work weekends and they may have like a day off. Some do night shifts. Um, some pharmacists do what's called a seven on seven off. So like they do one week of work um, and then they have a whole week off after that. So there's so many different schedules it's it's really hard to keep straight but like those are the things that I didn't think about but I those are the things you should think about so that 
when you get to the jobs that you're choosing, maybe those are the decisions that you make. Hey, I have a family. I probably want to spend the seven on seven off. That way I can spend the next week with my family. You know, those are some of the things that you can think about. And with COVID, what's kind of interesting is that we went, we went all remote last year. So um, for me, I, I practically see patients, and I still do, I still see patients via Zoom or telephone. Um, I do occasionally have patients that come to clinic again, but most of them are just for their first injection training. Um, but hopefully once we're starting to build out the clinic, we'll start to bring patients back in because usually when patients are in the clinic is when you can do the billing and all that stuff. So providers the same way, but it's just because of COVID, um, the, you know, the laws were really relaxed on what you can do. So hopefully that answered your question, but um, you know, when you're in pharmacy school, just, you know, you can still choose what you've always been doing as a hobby. Um, I would say like, when we get to choosing a school, you have to think about maybe like location. If you're in, you're into skiing, but you went to the deserts of Arizona, you probably won't get to do what you get to do. Um, and there's a good chance too that while you're there and you finish school, you might be taking the law exam for that state. So I don't know, there's a good chance, I'm not saying it's hundred percent, that you'll maybe work there for a little bit while too. So think about the things that you can do where you're at. Um, I had a question about, have you ever thought about opening up your own pharmacy? And the answer is yes. So that was the first thing that I wanted to do when I came into pharmacy school was because I uh, volunteered at an independent pharmacy, I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna go into pharmacy school and opening my own pharmacy. The only thing that kind of shut down my dream on that was that I talked to my brother who at the same time went to the school to his school and I asked him, do you want to open up a family business? And he said, no. <laughs> and so I said, okay, maybe that's not the right way. I still sort of pursued it because in my first year, so once you end up pharmacy school, depending on how established the school is, they may have a whole bunch of organizations or you can create one, but there's organizations that are the same across the nation. And one of them is the national, uh, sorry, NCPA, the National Community Pharmacists Association. So I joined that as a uh, one of the student leads. I think I was the webmaster for it. And I learned a lot about it. And we had a whole bunch of guest lectures that came in to talk about the pharmacies that they own. So mind you, like I'm in Virginia, so it's definitely a little bit different than California, but there's a lot of pharmacy owners. And they were talking about how they had to manage the business. They really liked the aspect of being able to talk to their patients who are just, you know, like kind of like their neighbors. But what's kind of hard is that what I learned about it was um, there was a lot of business that you had to know about it. So some people were pursuing like their dual MBA degree, um, which I'll talk about later. But um, at some point, um, actually like by my third year, I'd say um, my school hired a new pharmacy professor who actually specialized in ambulatory care. So it's something that I do now. Um, uh, so after I got an experience with her through her pharmacy, um, or not a pharmacy, but her clinic at this, um, this federally qualified low-income um, Hispanic population clinic, I like loved it and then decided to switch my careers. Like Literally, I think every year in pharmacy school, I kept switching what I wanted to do. And I, at some point by my third year, I was like, I think I have three things that I want to do. I want to become an informatics pharmacist. I want to do ambulatory care. I want to teach. Maybe I want to do this and that. I got like so much FOMO <laughs> from like so many different people. And then some my mentor was like, you just got to choose one and stick with it. So in the end, because my experience with her was so great, and such a huge impact, I decided just to just to pursue it. And that's what I ended up doing is I'm gonna be just like her. I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna do ambulatory, I'm gonna probably go to the same residencies that she went to. Unfortunately, I like got rejected twice from her residency. So um, this is where I ended up being. Uh, and so it's, the next question is, how do you need to be to volunteer at a pharmacy? You can be any age that you want. Um, I would. Uh, Probably think that maybe 16 and older though, um, because you you know working age and you want to get. I would say like a tip is to actually get your technician license 
and go ahead and just kind of work as a technician because it becomes a, like, you know, as the job market, the way it is, and there's so many technicians, so many pharmacy students, so many pharmacists um, that there is now rarely, or if any, like locations are accepting volunteers because they want to kind of pay you to do more than just the, the usual thing. I actually came in and volunteered as a clerk. So I did never like actually touched anything and I would have recommended to myself and, and, and would have told myself back then to just go ahead and go with the technician license because I never got to touch any of the drugs. And it was kind of boring, <laughs> I would say, of watching the pharmacist instead of actually doing anything. Um, so a lot of students that come into our school, they've had that technician background and they really had enjoyed it. Like they, they're like, I'm experienced. And I'm just like, yeah, you're definitely way more experienced than I was when I went into school. Um, but that's my guess is that it's just working age to volunteer. But if you happen to go to an in, know where an independent pharmacy is, go ahead and just ask and see like, is there any just clerkship things? And then maybe on their spare time, learn from the pharmacist. You probably can't touch the drugs or anything like that, but you can observe and just observing that patient and, and pharmacist or pharmacy team experience might help you. And then maybe even walking down the aisles because we really have to know like literally everything in the aisles, especially like the over-the-counter products. Um, the one thing though is like, if you work in a big grocery store though, I think they might not accept volunteers. And also like, you'll probably be asked where things are like in Target, you know, like going to the different aisles and figuring things out. Okay. All right, what about the common types of employment? Um, and kind of like going back to that volunteering, just go ahead and just go walk around. I mean, you just never know really. Like, I don't know um, the landscape of it. I just know that a lot of students have told me it's very difficult to find places to volunteer, but you'd be surprised. So just go in and ask. So what are the common types of employment? So I kind of um, talked about the different types already, which includes hospital, working physician offices, specialty clinics. So in the hospital, I mean, that's pretty much all pharmacy like what pharmacy students think when they get into pharmacy is that a pharmacy school is that there's only two areas you can go to, which is a community pharmacy, pharmacy or the hospital. And a lot of times I was just like, I don't know if I want to be in the hospital. It's kind of scary. But in all honesty, once you're in there and you get your experience, it's really amazing. So you could be in transitions of care, which is like this new field of pharmacy where um, you know, once someone get, gets discharged, you're there to educate them and really kind of handhold them out while they're still sick to uh, find all the people that they need to find and get that recovery and stay out of the hospital. You have people who really just love high intense, like on your feet thinking and just like all those codes, they would go probably well in the emergency rooms. Um, for those who, you know, want to pursue you know, um, or who have like family members or things that they've been personally affected, want to work in the oncology centers or cancer centers. You can be in the cardiac care units, uh, intensive care units, be part of the infectious disease team. Like pharmacy has a really stronghold in the infectious diseases team because there's so many medications out there and a lot of medicate, um, a lot of infections are kind of overcoming those drugs because they're constantly being given to patients. And then over time, those bugs get stronger. And so it's up to your team to kind of decide, okay, when is a good time to de-escalate or quickly take them off of something really intense to something that will just cover that, like that area, like that specific infection and so on and so forth until you see that patient eventually get off. Because there's just so many different drugs in that field that they do have a specific team called the antimicrobial stewardship team. Um, for physician offices, for specialty clinics, I kind of am part of like a specialty clinic. Um, and kind of when saying that too, is that I also have a contract with a specialty pharmacy. So my clinic doesn't have any medications. Like we're literally like a physician, but we contract with specialty pharmacies that actually have all these highly expensive highly regulated medications. 
All right, here are the other specialties. So when I put this slide together, I kind of thought like assembling like the team of Marvel characters or something like that. Like <laughs> um, that's what it feels like, but you'll be amazed. You, I think when I came into pharmacy school, I was more like, I was amazed at first. And all of a sudden I started feeling very overwhelmed. Like I said, I kept changing, like making my decisions, like which, which area do I go into? I didn't know you could be that area into, as a pharmacist. So that includes you, like I have a friend who's actually a nuclear pharmacist. So um, I have some friends who like rotated in there as a student. And what you do is like, you know, you're, you're super covered and you have limited time of when you can be exposed to these radioactive medications. And then there's also people who join the Air Force or Navy or anything like that. I was doing a rotation at the Na Walter Reed National Military Academy. It's amazing. Like it's uh, like if you want any drug, you can have it. And that's where the president goes to. Um, and then also like you can be a lawyer pharmacist, you can be an informatics pharmacist. So if you're less about, you know, you know, your personality is that you don't really need that patient exposure. Like it's not the thing for you. Um, a lot of people like data, like they like to be an informatics pharmacist, they like to create order sets, like they listen to people, but then they create something, they test it out, run things over in their computer system, and then solve problems. Like those are the pharmacists that, that exist, and that's something I want to do too, but that is a growing field. Informatics pharmacist is a very highly growing field. And then also if you want to be a part of a team that creates like uh, new technology like data sensors, all those things like that. You can be a pharmacist in that too. All right, so where do we fit in? Pretty much anywhere. I tell a patient like anywhere you've gone to, you probably have a pharmacist there, but we're part of now this whole integrative interprofessional team-based type of care. So you probably heard from hospitals that, you know, they're going to get dinged if the, if the patient goes back into the hospital. So how do we prevent that? And the way is to make sure you have high touch, high care from everybody. Like no one can really fall, like they can't fall through the cracks through anyone's care. And in doing so, we now like, we have schools where we learn together, we go out into the field and we work together. Like this whole model now is not just on a single service of a provider, but more as the outcome of a patient's care based on everybody that they've seen. Uh, we also help with any consulting or if you guys just got a question about a drug, they just outreach us and we just like do the research for them and then just say, here's the evidence, here's our recommendations. You can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> Um, we obviously do verification of all the medications. So anytime a provider writes a prescription, we're the one that's verifying to make sure it's appropriate to go through. And then we, we are also educators as well. So a lot of providers uh, or the team, even the staff, they ask, you know, hey, a new drug came out. Can one of the person in the pharmacy team do a talk for us? And that's something that we do as well. Like we'll present the data, we'll talk about the new medication, what it's used for, when should you use it, how much does it cost, how does it work, and what do we tell patients. So I, throughout the presentation, I'll also these, give these blue tips, um, something to like, you know, maybe jot down, but I think you guys have access to these slides. For the tips, like communication is key. So where do we fit in? Just make sure that your communication is on par because there's so many of us now in a patient's care that like if you play the telephone game, the message is going to like get skewed in some way. So communication is so important. Um, so if that's something, again, if that's something that you're not strong at, like myself, you just ask the professors, you ask for mentorship, you just do whatever you can to increase that ability. Because any profession that you go through, technically like any like anyone, um, you should have good communication skills because the person that should not have good communication skills is usually your patient because they're not, you know, they're not savvy in technical jargon and anything like that. So you should be able to, in a sense, I keep telling my patients and uh, my students about this is to have a split brain where one side of your brain is like actively translate because you're constantly like translating for patients. You're translating between two like two teams, uh, two parts of your team, which is this patients who like, they generally teach you to read about a fifth to eighth grade 
reading level uh, to communicate in that sense. And then the other team, which is the high, you know, medically trained team that's talking to you. All right, so here is a timeline to think about when you're, you know, from, from starting now for most of you guys to becoming a pharmacist or whatever you wanna do with your pharmacy degree um, is that you generally will need prerequisites. So hopefully you guys are already picking up all your sciences or I don't know, maybe there's an economics or philosophy class in there. Um, but mostly like you just need some prerequisites that are about two to four years worth. So a lot of pharmacy schools now are kind of increasing their prerequisites to the point where you almost need a bachelor's degree to come in. Um, but a lot of schools still accept just that two year um, prerequisite. So like, let's say my brother goes to University of the Pacific in Stockton or UOP. He has a program where it's a two plus three, two plus four program. So it's two years of undergrads fulfilling all prerequisites, three years of pharmacy school or four years of pharmacy school. And a lot of schools also still take prerequisites if you can complete them. Um, I'll talk to you about what those prerequisites are, but just make sure you get that list because every list from every different school may contain like one or two extra courses like anatomy. So I'm gonna tell you right now, the reason why I didn't go to, I didn't apply to many schools is because I couldn't get into an anatomy class. I've like tried, I went through, I went to like three different community colleges, UCSD was not offering uh, anatomy and I don't know if I wanted to travel anywhere else. Someone actually said that they're gonna go to a different state just to get that requirement so that they can apply to their school. So think about those prerequisites ahead of time and where you can get them. Um, the next thing is congratulations, you got into a pharmacy school. So uh, the, that will be the next three or four years of your life to learn all about everything you want to learn about med medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, therapeutics, and a lot of some electives in between. Um, and here I put dual degrees is because a lot of pharmacy schools actually offer a second degree if you want to take it. So some, I think some schools may offer PharmD, maybe PhD. Um, I know the school that I went to was a PharmD MBA. And it's something that I sort of regret not doing is doing uh, my, master's, uh, uh, my master's in, in business administration. So because like if I really wanted to open a pharmacy school, I probably, I'm sorry, pharmacy school, pharmacy, I'd probably go for an MBA degree just so I can have that business background too. But you don't necessarily need it. Um, the only way to get two degrees, I think, especially with the master's is as long as you come in with a bachelor's degree. So for people who did the two years of prerequisites but don't have a degree, you likely can't apply for the other degree. Um, you'll just go for the PharmD degree. Um, the next thing is that after your four years, you then take the national and state examination. So just when you think that after four years of like a lot of exams, midterms and finals that you're over, it's never over in pharmacy. So I still take a lot of exams. I still do like a lot of uh, continuing education hours, just like medical, nursing, everybody. We still have to do that to maintain our license. And it's good for us because we are always getting updated information. But we do have a national and state exam. So the national exam, every pharmacist should take it. I mean, you don't have to, you just end up with your degree and not practice, that's okay. But hopefully you are intending to practice based on the tuition, um, but hopefully intending to practice. So you want your national exam. And generally a lot of, I would say a lot of, it's like an 80% pass rate nationally. It's, it's not that bad. For the state exam though, um, that would depend on which state that you're in, but soon enough, um, I would have to say, California was the hardest state exam I've ever taken, and it is known for it. But I think they may be like thinking about um, switching over to maybe uh, the ones that are more common with the other states, which is the um, the MPJE. Forgot what it stands for, but it is a a law exam. So they do talk about laws because you know you're not you have to make sure that you do everything by the book. And then um, what's interesting about uh, when you're thinking about where you're going to be working, especially after school, is that when you get, you need at least one state state um, license. So you need to be certified by one state. 
And if you decide to go in somewhere like a government funded program, like, and I think with, um, it's mostly with uh, the VAs or veteran affairs locations or the Indian Health Services or anything that's government. If it's a government uh, run program, generally they only need one exam, law exam from any state in the country, which is great. So like, let's say I went to Texas, I went to the Veteran Affairs in Texas, the VA, I didn't need a Texas license. I actually just kept my Virginia license. But when I moved to Oregon, Oregon was not like the VA or anything like, or government. It was just a state uh, a school and hospital. I did have to get my Oregon license. So now I have license in three states. And if you wanna maintain your license, that's again, if you're thinking about finances, each state uh, does have a price to pay. So after you finish your continuing education, California right now increased their prices. So every two years I pay, I'm gonna guess around $400, $500 for the year or for the two years. Oregon just increased their prices. So now I pay $306 every two years. And then my Virginia license is just every year they don't do a two year thing. That's like about $100. <laughs> so, you know, you have to account for those expenses but hopefully you make your decision and you only have one state license. I have a friend who went for like, 10 state licenses. I don't know if it was for just to be very well versed in those states and eventually working there or just knowing that it's gonna cost them some money. <laughs> All right, so now that you passed your exams, what do you do after that? You can either one, find a job, which is usually, it's usually the retail community phar uh, pharmacy jobs that you, you're trained right off the bat. Or, you know, like through your other experiences, like if you were in school and you picked up a, you know, an internship at a hospital or specialty pharmacy or whatever it may be, you can probably still, you know, if they hire you, you keep that job for the rest of your life. Other times it's right place, right time. I've had people who've gone through their residencies. So there's a little bit of strategy to it. They did that, re that rotation sorry, I didn't say residency, but rotations that they, they rotated through an experience at the FDA, they ended up getting a job there because they needed someone there. So there's so many opportunities, but I would say there are other avenues as well, which is the avenue I took, which is going through residencies and fellowships. So generally students could, could just graduate, take one year of residency and then get a really great clinical job wherever they wanna go. Other students like myself, we go through two years of training because one year was very general, two years, we, the second year decided specifically ambulatory care is the right one for me. And then because the job market was not so great and I was getting a little picky, I decided to continue on for another year of a fellowship in a teaching fellowship so I could learn to teach better, you know, learn about research, all that stuff. And then finally ended up with my dream job, which is here. <laughs> so everybody does have their own different timelines, but just know that these are kind of like the general buckets of where people land in, which is you definitely have to make it past that national state exam, but anything that happens after that is so unique to many different people. All right, so let's talk about some prerequisites. Um, this should be very general enough, but this is something I took off of our well, my school's website, Marshall B. Ketchum University, um, but you'll need general biology, general chemistry, organic chemistry, you know, some of the things that you might want to consider is you'll see it a lot in pharmacy school. Is that something you want to pursue? Human anatomy, physiology, microbiology, calculus. So you'll do a lot of math in pharmacy school. Most of the, most of the time, it's more of math to how uh, to come up with how do you create a medication that has the right amount of drug. General physiology, uh, psychology, economics, English, behavioral science, and then of course communication courses. So those writing courses that you got, you guys just got to pass. So my tips really here is just while you're looking at the different school prerequisites, just know that what are the differences between them because you can go through and at least get like all the main ones that will help you be able to apply to many schools. But then if you have a specific school that you really wanted to go to, look at for those additional school requirements, especially on their website, just do your research, like go through their program, ask them if you can go do a tour, ask them for anything else that they need on the application, because you don't want to end up like me where 
I was very limited to schools because I didn't think about getting anatomy early. And so I was scrambling during the summer to try to find an anatomy course. And in the end, I ended up getting an anatomy physiology combination course, which didn't fly with certain schools. So just some things to think about. All right, and then next is the admissions process. So FarmCast, um, it's like, there's like a specific, you know, when you guys get to make this decision, there is a specific application online, which makes it so much easy, but you wanna make sure you got your transcripts, your letter of recommendations, and then of course, prepare for interviews early. Just prepare as if you're gonna get that interview, because I, I highly doubt that you won't get an interview. I feel like you will, so you wanna be prepared for individual panel, Q and A's, whatever it takes and ask them for a tour. Um, if you go onto, you know, farmcast.org, you'll see all the schools that, you know, all the pharmacy schools, just go through that and just do your research now. So then here's a tip is making sure you choose the right school for you. So kind of philosophical, but also thinking about opportunities that you wanna pursue five years down the line, 10 years down the line. I know it's far, but you just gotta, build some paths, A, B, and C. If I can reach there, what do I need to do? Location, some people don't care, class sizes, costs, and just prepare it and practice for your interview. All right, the next one is typical day of a student. So here's what you'll do is two to three years of didactic courses. It's full of tests run, um, but you get biology, the same things that you get in your first, uh, through your bachelor's degree, Biostatistics, like I said, again, know your statistics. You'll get communications courses. Our school offers mandatory Spanish. So because we're in the Southern California region area, we think that our students should be well-versed in some basic Spanish. Um, compounding, so making things, that's like the fun part, making IVs, making like lozenges, candies, all these things. Physical assessments, so this was the one thing that people didn't wanna do. They're like, between medical school and pharmacy school, I just don't wanna see blood. Unfortunately, I have to tell you now, you'll, you will see blood. <laughs> it might not be a lot, like surgery, but it's like, you know, you're gonna have to prick someone's finger, you're gonna get pricked um, to, to, you know, read some, some blood sugar levels, all those things. There's gonna be some slight blood in there. Um, you might even see more during your rotations. Um, some therapeutics, we learned top 300 drugs. If that's not for you, I think you can do it. You believe in yourself. People like, I'm amazed how much I can know. Research, internships, and then getting onto rotations is, you know, something for the students to actually apply all their knowledge. So here's a tip here. I know someone brought this up before, but also make sure you have good life work balance. So during the things, join organizations, get to know your cohorts because they become like your Honestly, pharmacy friends, like they become your life friends because they're the last people there with you learning through the blood, sweat and tears. And then get tutoring and accommodations. All schools should have tutoring and accommodations. So like for instance, if you have some learning, uh, learning accommodation that you need, there should be um, very like confidential uh, accommodations where it will allow you, you know, they'll allow you to take the test longer, take it with, you know, some sort of thing that will help you. And then expectations, just know it will be time intensive. You'll get lack of sleep. You'll be doing a whole bunch of assessments. Everything will be hands-on. People might be touching you when they're doing physical assessments. Um, and then the most important thing that we mostly really care about is that you have to really show your professionalism. But I have to say right now, like I've averaged maybe five hours of sleep since pharmacy school. So if you're like an eight hour sleep, don't worry. There are actually people who can do that. <laughs> they can still maintain their sleep. I just choose to procrastinate and then probably regret it the next morning. Um, with tips, make sure you use your resources. The pro school provides you everything because you pay for it. So read everything you can and then met, meet regularly with your mentors. All right, and then um, the thing that I talked about, you guys probably were like, what does rotations even mean? So this is where you do your experiences. So we have the introductory where in the first two years you do 300 hours worth of hospital and community rotations. And then, and they don't really expect you to know too much because you're just new. So make sure to 
you know, practice or take every opportunity because you're, you know, they, they understand, they're just watching you. And then even in your fourth year or third or fourth year, um, you get these 1,440 hours worth of rotations where you can do a set of community, a set of ambulatory care, a set of inpatient, pretty much this is the year where you kind of almost decide what you want to be. <laughs> um, and if you don't make that decision yet, go into residency, a general one, and then figure out from there. That's what I did. Um, but you'll do patient presentations, share and leading visits. Like you're in there, you're like literally as a pharmacy intern, you can do anything a pharmacist can do. You just can't do that final verification and you should have direct supervision at all times, but you literally can do anything. Um, documentation, you alert the providers, you contact the manufacturers, you assist in the expansion of services. So here I have two students, actually now pharmac actual pharmacists, because they just graduated today. I have Lena and uh, Martha, and they both helped me in like um, a, uh, actually expanding the services because my clinic is new. We just like started with two conditions and now we have way too many. Um, and then finally, uh, helping with health fairs and simulated patients. All right, uh, quickly on postgraduate, you probably won't care until much later, but I would say think about this even coming into pharmacy school is that if you wanna do even more, um, I guess more hands-on like intense training, like every residency and fellowship is almost equivalent to like two or three years worth of pharmacy uh, experiences. It's like really intense um, and they do pay you for it, which is nice but about 8,945 people registered this year, all the students, and then only 67% matched. So unlike medical, we don't all get matched. Uh, hopefully that number grows up later in the future, but this is where you can focus on either more clinical, more managed care in the residency or more research and more training if that's where your heart lies or industry where you wanna work with uh, companies. Those are fellowships. Um, I had a question here as a high school student to get more information on your dream school. Should I contact your counselor and ask for guidance? Yeah, ask them, ask them what they know. And if in the end you don't get the information that you need, uh, I will provide my contact at the end if you wanna talk a little bit more about it. Um, you know, just, just to help you get started and see who else can provide you that information. And maybe maybe even shadowing. That's what I did as a, as a student is I just shadowed like my cousin and um, then started to volunteer. And then after that made the decision to go to pharmacy school. Um, my postgrad experience really is all I can say these three things intense. It's almost like doing rotations 2.0. It's like, you're already a pharmacist and now like you're still getting extra training people all eyes on you. It's kind of cool, but um, also intense. It's very gratifying. And of course, it really made me grow even much more. Like I said before, these post-grad experiences after you finish pharmacy school are like two to three years in one year. All right, and this is quickly about my pharmacotherapy clinic. Um, so that's me and my team. We're a small team, but we're growing. We're at the St. Jude's Pharmacotherapy manage uh, Medication Management Clinic. Um, we're a new clinic, so we have this dream of like creating so many different services. And right now we're focusing a lot on chronic autoimmune conditions. And then hopefully in the future, we're gonna add everything back. Diabetes, high blood pressure, a whole bunch of things. It, the list goes on. So who knows, you might end up working at my clinic. <laughs> and then typical day for me, it's actually really nice. I get to, because I'm an academic, I can actually schedule how I want things to be scheduled, but I usually spend time working up patients. I do about five patients per day, and I only have technically two days of the week because I teach most of the other days, but I do in-person telehealth, telephone appointments. I do a lot of drug information. So if people have a question, go ahead, send me the question and I'll figure things out. And then I do injection training, I do documentation, and then I repeat every week. So here I was just gonna quickly say um, with other typical days. So as a student, I really got to have so much different experiences and I took the, the advantage to do so. So do this in any school that you're at, just take advantage if you have a rotation in even like a different country, go for it. I try to apply out of the country, but I never get chosen um, to go to like any place to, to do overseas um, healthcare. So hopefully one day. 
But in terms of other typical days, like if you were to rotate as an infectious disease pharmacist or an ICU pharmacist, every day is just what you make of it. And sometimes you have set hours because that's how you get hired for, but other times you can probably come up with your own schedule. So um, I know we're kind of getting a little over time here. So feel free to ask, uh, send me any um, questions that you guys may have. In terms of most interesting cases, you know, again, I said about one to two interventions per patient. So you're, it's never a dull moment, but you care about the patient so much. You look at their costs, adherence, the side effects, the drug interactions, their access. And I have cases that goes from, you know, I can't swallow this pill, something that, you know, maybe the provider doesn't have time to talk to the patient about, or they've never seen it. Um, and then patients also have questions, is this a side effect? Because there are so many side effects that happen with every medication. And then also patients don't think about, you know, does it come in different forms that they can have like a patch, something they can swallow, something they can drink, whatever it is. And then here in the corner, I always get the question of, can I drink it, drink alcohol? Can I smoke cannabis while I'm on these medications? And even providers ask me those questions. So I tell them, yeah, there's an interaction or uh, I guess that's okay. I think the most interesting case I've ever gotten was generally pharmacists have been taught to tell everybody to quit smoking. And I had this one case where the patient goes, I want to quit, but the doctor told me I can't. <laughs> And I told them, what? And they're like, no, look in the notes. I looked in the notes. It looks like, oh, one doctor, because of the specific condition, which happens to be ulcerative colitis, what's an interesting thing to know, it, note is studies have shown that smoking actually helps with this condition. And the one thing that I could help was that, okay, okay, so you can smoke, but how much are you smoking? They're like, I don't know, 10, 10 cigarettes. And I was like, can you do one? I mean, at least one. I know we're concerned about cancer and everything. So one, and at least maybe it will help you in both ways. <laughs> so that was my most interesting case. And it's one of those things where you're just like, you tell students in class and you learn as a student, smoking is bad for you, but maybe there are conditions that we have to consider before we have them quit cold turkey. And as a bonus, because I'm in academia, as anyone in, interested in teaching, um, I learned by my third year I wanted to teach, but we, we do teaching services and scholarships. So I teach, I work in a clinic, and I do a lot of research. Um, I liked that I can also precept. So that means, you know, I work with the students in my clinic. And then we attend a whole bunch of conferences. So we're like highly known for our networking. So we're not, you know, the, the pharmacists in the basement sort of pharmacists. Nowadays, it's highly encouraged to all of us to go out, social media, all conferences, whatever it is, and start socializing and learning about different medications and things like that. So you're never in a vacuum. You always have friends anywhere in the country, in the world. All right, so here are my tips for success. Know that pharmacy is a career. So you wanna plan ahead, even thinking about your financials, ask, research, ask for shadowing, um, ask me, whatever you'd like to do, get as much information to make sure that you're ready to invest in your career. Take the risk and reap the rewards while you're in school. So volunteer, go to those health fairs, speak up, take notes. This is your last chance as a student, unless you take more school. Uh, reflect, know who you are, uh, because it's going to be intense. It's, it's going to make you question yourself. Become a lifelong learner so you'll never stop learning. Things in healthcare changes constantly. Be an advocate for not only, only your profession, but everything about healthcare. And of course, that last thing I talked about, which is networking. So sorry to like rush yourself through that, but um, here is my contact information. Um, my email is kvo at ketchum.edu. And of course, like I said, with networking, add me on LinkedIn. You'll find like, I'll do some posts that are, you know, how to manage with burning out and all that stuff like that. So, and that's a way for, if you have a question, you can also message me there and maybe I can get you in touch with that particular pharmacist or, you know, even some physicians or other healthcare workers. But thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ro. Um, I don't think we have time for the Q&A, but you did answer some of the questions during the your presentation, so that's wonderful. And 
Um, if any of the uh, audience audience members, I'm sorry, have any other questions, you can feel free to contact her um, at her email or at her LinkedIn, as she said. Um, so I think we're ready to wrap up. I'll be quickly presenting the wrap up presentation over here so you guys can get ready um, for the wrap up. Okay, so once again, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowe. I at least I know that I learned a lot as a, a future farm D myself. And I'm just really excited. Um, I, I really like shadowing um, and co-hosting um, pharmacists because, you know, it gets it's really exciting and inspiring for me as a, as I mentioned, as a future farm D. Um, anyway, um, considering um, this wonderful live session, we would like uh, we would like to encourage everyone to reflect on it. And with these three um, questions over here that are, what brought you to this session today? Um, what are three major takeaways you got from it? And what do you want to learn more about? You know, um, just let it sink in. You can write a note. You can just answer them right in your head, however you want it. If you do write it, um, if you do answer this question's for writing, we want to highlight that the writing is not required. However, we do encourage you to submit it to our website for publication and recognition of your hard work and to enhance your future applications, as we mentioned earlier. If you want to learn more about pre-health shadowing and how to get involved in our program, we encourage you to visit our website. You can become an asynchronous volunteer to get certified hours through professional nominations, graphic design, and social media promotion. And we are also accepting team member applications if you want to take on a more active role in PHS, to lead projects and initiatives to be up here with us. Once again, we are humbly asking that if you are financially able to donate, that you please consider doing so. It costs a lot to keep our program up and running and free to all of you. So if you are someone who can afford to, or if you know someone else who can, Please support those who cannot by donating to our organization so everyone can continue to get the education they deserve. Otherwise, we simply ask you spread the word about Through Health Shadowing to reach as many students as possible. Now, we're at the part we have all been waiting for, earning a digital certificate for the virtual shadowing hours from this session today. So the first step is go onto our website and find our professionals course pages and enter the course from Dr. Kim Bo. Next, you can take our quick 10 question multiple choice quiz based on the content from the session today. You will have up to 30 minutes per attempt to earn 70% or higher to get your certificate. We know, of course, that sometimes technology can be difficult, so we allow up to two attempts to take the assessment. But if you run into any other difficulties, please do not hesitate to contact us so we can help you. To ensure that our website does not crash from a high influx of students, we recommend waiting 30 minutes to an hour after the session to take the quiz, which will be open indefinitely. Finally, once we have passed, you can click the Finish Course button at the bottom of the professional's page and download your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours. If unfortunately you missed a part of this session or you want to go back and view other sessions to earn more certificates with um, verified virtual shadowing hours, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch our previous recordings. You can also find them via the professional pages on our website and take the post shadowing assessments for these as well. Be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our email list for the latest updates on upcoming sessions and events. We are currently booked every weekday through June for virtual shadowing sessions, so we definitely hope to see you guys over there. Once again, Thank you all for um, joining us today. And please stick around if you have any questions and myself and other team members will be happy to answer them.
this shadowing session is officially over and I invite you all to log off. Have a wonderful day, evening, or night.